thank you again. Uh, thanks for your patience. We had a <coughs> uh, just a small snafu with the laptop missing. I left it in the restaurant, and so we had to go back and get it. Thanks for your patience again. So <coughs> just before we left, uh, before lunch, what we basically looked at was the connect, what is inside the connect, the hardware, and what the SDK provides. Right? So we basically saw that the SDK is really straightforward. There's only one <coughs> class that we look at, which is runtime. And then from runtime, we can get access to all of the raw, uh, raw data streams from both the depth camera and the video camera. And we get all of these events <coughs> that we can uh, craft, that we can, uh, that we can capture um, to get the data back. So let's get into code. The first thing I'm going to do is my connect is not connected, so I'm going to connect it first. Uh, to this, I said you can get a separate cable to connect your uh, device to the PC. Let's do that. And when that happens, <coughs> you see that it's, uh, it's connected now. So one of the <coughs> important things about the connect is it'll just show up in your um, device manager right click properties, device manager, and in here you'll actually see the connect show up um, right under, what image there it is, Microsoft Connect. You basically see the, the connect device, the connect cameras, both the 3D and the VGA, and then the connect uh, array control device, right? The mi microphone array. The important thing also is when you install the Connect, it automatically gets installed in your uh, Windows system as, as a default mic, right? And so that's the reason <coughs> I was saying that you can use the Connect with any of your applications that use the Windows, uh, you know, the speech API or the recording API, because at the end of the day, the Connect microphone array is just another microphone that Windows, by default, recognizes. So that's a, a very good thing as well. So um, having looked at this, let's actually open up Visual Studio and build a Connect application. Uh, now, how many of you have um, worked with Visual Studio in the past? Just a quick show of hands. OK, so that's about half. Uh, the audience. Okay, so that's great. So what we'll do now is, um, you know, I'll, I'll walk through the process and then certain steps, you know, I'll sort of explain a little bit more for the few of us who have not used Visual Studio. But if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me and ask me so we can clarify it right now. Uh, in Visual Studio, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new project and start from the beginning of it. I'm going to say new project and I'm going to choose a Windows project and I'm going to choose a WPF application, the Windows Presentation Foundation um, application. But you can use Connect with any client project, which means you can use Connect with Windows Forms application. You can use Connect with uh, XNA applications, with gaming applications, and so on and so forth. But for now, let's just choose WPF. And I'm going to say, I'm going to call this Hello NTU, which is the uh, name of the project. And when it opens up, it'll show me a blank template, <coughs> a blank uh, WPF application template. So this is the um, WPF application. How many of you have built WPF applications before? Okay, a few here, a few here. Okay, so in that case, I'm just going to take two, two seconds and explain uh, the structure of a WPF application. What you're seeing here, <coughs> This, this right here is the UI. This is the window uh, where you set up the user interface elements. And the way you set that up is by using this markup language called XAML. It's, it's like HTML, but it's a markup language. You use it to type, uh, you know, define the elements that you want on the screen. So for instance, <coughs> I could come in and type things like button, right? And what it will do is it will create a button on the, 
uh, screen for me. It's just a really large button. Um, right, so you see it's just a really large button called hello. Uh, I can do things like width equals 200 and then height equals 200. And then you see basically by typing markup code, you create elements to show up. Alternatively, you can also use the toolbox and bring controls from here. So for instance, if I wanted a, another button from uh, that I want to create from the toolbox, I just choose this button and double click it maybe, and then here's another button. And you can actually see the code that got generated here, this button, uh, content equals button, and height is whatever, and so on and so forth. Right. So this is the markup, this is how you set up the UI. Um, in terms of the code that gets executed, it's in this file called uh, mainwindow.xaml.cs for C-sharp, right? And this is the code that will run when the program actually runs. So if I wanted to do something uh, when I click my button, I will go in and choose one of the events of my button and then program against that event, right? So <clears throat> for button, I'll probably choose the click event, <clears throat> which you see is highlighted, it's selected by default, that's the default event handler. So I can double click on the click and Visual Studio will automatically um, create uh, an event handler for me. Uh, in this case, it's calling a button underscore click and any code that I type here will get executed when I click on the button, right? So as a simple example, if I type something like messagebox.show and if I say something like hello world, And now if I run the application, my form will come up, it'll show me the buttons that I created, and then when I click on the button, it will say hello, right? Really simple, so that's that's building WPF application. It's really straightforward, it's just you know, setting up your UI and then writing the code uh, behind to execute when you do something on the UI. So in this case, the first thing I want to do is um, you know, you start using the connect. So maybe what we want to initially start with is by reading the raw stream. So maybe we'll start by reading the video stream and then the depth camera stream right after that. So I'm going to delete all of this. And instead of a button, I'm going to bring in an image control. Right, the image control basically is used to display some image. Uh, if you look at the properties of an image, <coughs> It exposes a property called source right here. And if you see what it is, it's basically uh, the source property just takes some well-formed image. I'm just going to send it this file called ball.png. And it's just an image of a ball. And I'm going to say OK. And you'll see basically the image control displays my ball. right? So it's really straightforward. Um, it takes an image and displays it on the screen. But what I want to do now is instead of having and display a static ball image. I wanted to read the stream from the video camera and then display it. So let's go ahead and do that. The, like I said, the first thing we should do is we should start working with the runtime, right? Because runtime is the class that is used to represent the connect. And if you want to start programming connect, you start with creating a runtime object. So let's go do that. Let's go and say, Let's create a new runtime. But first of all, this is not a Connect project yet. It's only a WPF application, right? So what we need to do is we need to add a reference to a Connect to the Connect uh, library, which, if you remember, is this file right here. So by adding a reference to this file, we can start programming the Connect in this application. So the way you add a reference is really simple. You come into the Solution Explorer, right-click on Reference say add reference, and I know it's a .NET reference, so I can come in here. I, I'll see a lot of DLLs that I can add a reference to. Uh, the one that I'm looking for is called Microsoft.research.connect.dll. And so I'm just gonna sort this by name, and then search for Microsoft.research.connect. I'm gonna say, choose this, say okay. And now what it's going to do is it's going to add it to my list of um, 
references in this project. Now I can basically, what that allows me to do is it allows me to now access all of these classes from within my project. It allows me, um, all, it brings in all of this functionality into my project. So the first thing I want to do is use the runtime uh, class. So I'm going to create an instance of runtime. So I can basically say something like Microsoft dot research dot connect dot nui dot runtime. I can call it connect, right? But every time you don't want to be typing such a long name. So what I could do is I could take this whole thing and make it into a using state. Now, if I say using Microsoft or Research or Connect or Nui, then I don't have to type the whole full name over and over again. I can just call it runtime, and I'm good to go. The um, first thing we need to do is we have to uh, create an instance of this runtime object. And uh, if you look at the possible methods here, you see there's this method called initialize. We have to initialize it first. So let's go ahead and do that. Now. <coughs> What I want to do is I want all of this initialization to happen as soon as my program launches, right? And so for that, you'll actually see that uh, my main window exposes an event called loaded, right? So this is the event that gets fired as soon as your window gets loaded. And so we're going to use this event to basically instantiate our connect and uh, initialize it. So basically what I'm going to say is connect equals run runtime connects, runtime dot connects, and then pass in zero. And this is how you do uh, connect chaining actually. So if you have, say for instance, three connects connected to my PC, if I have three connects connected to my PC, I would basically choose which connect, connect I'm uh, initializing by choosing zero or one or two here, right? depending on uh, how many connects you have, uh, this connects collection will uh, have that many elements. If you look at what uh, this connects is, let me show you what it is. Runtime dot connects is a collection, and it exposes a property called uh, count, right? And so runtime dot connects dot count. Um, it just basically exposes how many connects you have connected to your runtime. In fact, let's do that really quick. Before we write any line of code, I'm going to basically do this. I'm going to say message box dot show runtime dot connects dot count dot two string. All right. All right. We're not doing any button clicks anymore, so I'm going to delete this. So now what's going to happen is as soon as my project gets loaded up, my window underscore loaded is going to execute. And the only thing that's going to execute from within is it's going to show me uh, the count of the number of connects I have connected to my PC. So I'm going to run this. It loads up. I get this window that says one, right? So it tells me I have one connect connected. Right here is, let me show you something else. Let me unplug this connect, right? Now I unplugged it. Now if I run it, it's going to come up to zero. Does that make sense? Right? It tells you the number of connects, connects you have connected. All right, sweet. So I'm going to connect it back, and hopefully it's been detected. Now it says one, so that's good. Okay. So and basically, this is how you do connect chaining. You can find out how many uh, connects you have connected, and then uh, you can initialize all of them. So I know I have one connect. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to initialize that. Connect equals <coughs> runtime dot connects, and just choose the first one choose the first one, right? Normally you would run it in the loop to initialize all the connects, but for now I'm just gonna say I only have one, so go with it. The next thing I have to do after creating or instantiating a connect is to initialize it, right? So I have to basically come in and say connect dot initialize. And now you see that Visual Studio is telling us that initialize actually takes one parameter, right? And the parameter is of type runtime options. So what Visual Studio is smart enough to do is it knows that the parameter I'm going to pass in is of type runtime options, and so IntelliSense automatically highlights runtime options here. So all I have to do is press dot, and it'll tell me all the different properties in that runtime options enumeration, right? So at this point, 
I have to tell um, whether I want to use the color camera, right, which is this option, or I want to use the depth camera, or I want to use the depth camera and turn on player tracking, which I'll now tell you in a few minutes what that is, or finally, if I want to do scalable tracking, right? What this is going to do, for now, I'm just going to say, so I'll use color to close it. But what this is going to do is this. Let me show you really quickly. What that initialize statement does is <clears throat> when you call the initialize in the API, it actually comes in and initializes. It actually sets up the uh, driver chain in one of these subsystems, whether it is a subsystem for the video stream, whether it is a subsystem for the depth stream, or whether it is a subsystem for you know, uh, the skeleton fragment that comes up. So it basically initializes the, the driver um, subsystem. And that's basically what we're doing when we say connect.initialize. Now the next step, let me take you back into Reflector. So what we just did was we uh, did the initialize. You see that there's also an uninitialize that we should make sure we call every time the program closes, right? So what we should do is when my program, main window, fires the closing event or the closed event, which means the program is shut down. And see, here's the closed event. Let's double click it. Here's my event handler that gets created for me. I'm just going to come in and say connect dot uninitialize. And what this is going to do is it's going to it's it's going to do two things. It's going to release all of the resources that my connect is using on my USB um, subsystem, and it will close the connect driver stack. Right? So that's basically this is how you start writing any connect project. You basically instantiate your connect. You write code to initialize your connection with whatever option you need. For now, I'm just going to say use color. And then you remember to sort of uninitialize it when your program actually closes. So that's, uh, this is the whole initialization step of um, the connect. The, once you basically do the initialization, which is right here, we are free to basically, at this point, start using any of these streams, your video stream and your dev stream and so on. The first thing let's do is basically we want to need a stream from our video camera. So let's go start using that. I'm going to say connect dot video stream dot. And these are all of the options that my video stream supports. If you want to use the dot net reflector to find out all the options that video stream stream supports, come in here and just click on video stream. And you see that it basically is a type of something called image stream. So click on image stream. And these are all of the methods, and these are all of the properties that an image stream supports. So when you do the dot here, what you're seeing here is exactly these options right here. Right? So this is a good way to learn uh, about an unfamiliar API when you're programming it for the first time. So use dot and reflector and Visual Studio side by side to understand how all of it comes together. But if you look at all of the methods in image stream, you see that there's only three methods, in fact. There's the get next frame. It seems like it's used to read a frame from the buffer. We'll get to that in a second. There's an option for get valid resolutions, right? And we'll get to that in a second as well. But it seems like this is the pertinent option right now to open the stream, right? So let's go and do that. So I'm going to basically say connect.videostream.open. And now you basically see that it, it takes about four parameters. The first one is stream type. So I'm going to say dot, uh, just to see what all the valid options are. And I see that there are three options, depth, invalid, and video. So this time I want to basically get the video stream from the RGB camera, so I'm going to say video. Then the next option is something called pool size. And I'll take a second and explain what pool size is. Inside the Kinect, uh, we saw that it has the cameras, right? But it also has a small amount of memory, right? So what happens is when the Kinect actually reads data, it reads data and doesn't send it directly to your PC or to the Xbox. It reads the data and stores it in its memory buffer. There's a small memory buffer inside that gets, the data then gets stored inside that memory buffer. And then the application, whether it's on the PC or the Xbox, reads the data from the memory buffer, 
right? It doesn't really read the data directly from the camera. Does that make sense? Right? It uses a shared memory mechanism where the camera writes the data to a memory, and then the PC program reads the data from the memory. They don't really talk directly, and it's a, it's a, it's a best practice because you don't. This way, you are able to do. Uh, you're able to get a huge advantage, which is multiple programs can actually access the memory at the same time. Whereas only one program can, would be able to access the direct camera uh, uh, at a time, right? So with, because of the shared memory architecture, you can have multiple accesses happening at the same time. So what this uh, value pool size is asking us is it's asking us how many frames of memory should it allocate for storing the video frame buffer. So what I'm going to say is the option I'm going to choose is two, and here's the reason why. If I choose only one memory frame, then there are, there's a possibility of a reader-writer lock happening. So when the connect is writing into that memory frame, my application cannot be reading from the frame at the same time. right? And when my application is reading it, connect can't write to it at the same time. So you can basically create a conventional lock. So if you so say two at least, then connect would be writing into one frame, whereas you could be writing, uh, reading from the other frame. So at least two is a good idea. You can go more than two. The, the maximum limit is four. Uh, but you really won't need to use four frames unless your PC is really slow or something like that. Two is a safe number to go with in terms of allocating memory frame. OK, the third option is, you, is where you denote the resolution of the image you want to retrieve from the camera, right? And um, the, it's an enumeration, again, of type image resolution. I'm going to say dot. And you can actually see that this, this is actually one, two, three, four options, uh, where it's 1280 by 1024, 640 80, 320 by 240, and 80 by 60. An uh, important thing to remember here is that the video camera, the RGB camera, returns resolutions of 1280 by 1024 and 640 by 480, whereas the depth camera returns a resolution of either 320 by 240 or 80 by 60. Right? So you have to sort of keep that in mind. It's, I think the final version of the SDK when it launches will make it uh, even more specific. I think we'll end up calling RGB resolution 1280 to 1024 and depth resolution 640 or 320 240 and stuff like that. Right now, it's, it's a little confusing, but uh, it seems like you can actually choose this to go with the video, but then when you run the program, it'll edit out <coughs> because a video resolution can only be 640 by 480 or 1280 by 1024. So I'm going to choose 640 by 480. And then the final option that it's asking is something called image type. And if you look at the image type, it basically is just asking what is the format in which you want the image from the Kinect sensor, right? The Kinect sensor understands two formats for RGB. It understands the RGB format and understands the YUV format for color. Uh, but I'm just going to, at this point, say, give me straight color, which is going to return in RGB format. So literally, that's all <coughs> the code um, for opening the RGB camera stream looks like, right? So all you're saying is, I want to open the RGB camera stream. And from there, I'm expecting video and not depth data. I'm, I'm going to allocate two frames inside the connect memory to store the frames as they keep coming in. Now, if you do not read the frame before a new frame becomes available, uh, just the, the old frames will just get deleted over and over. So basically, it's, um, it's just going to get thrown out if you don't read it. And finally, you're basically saying, give it to me in resolution 640 by 480. And I want the RGB format instead of the YUV format. Any questions? OK. So what's going to happen now? As soon as you execute the statement, what's going to happen now is the Kinect uh, RGB camera is going to start reading data from the scene in front of it. In fact, let me run the program now. Even though you don't really see anything happening, the Kinect actually is reading data from the scene in front of it. Now, to actually get the data, what we need to do, because what's happening right now is it's reading the data, but it's only storing it into the local buffer. It's not really feeding it to us, right? So what we need to do to get the data from the buffer 
is let's use this method called get next frame, which is going to go to the buffer and pull the next frame that's available from uh, the buffer. So I'm going to come in and say, well, instead of doing it here, let me do this. Let me create a small button. There's a button like this. And let me bring it down here. And I'm going to double click this to get it to the event handler. And I'm going to now say, connect dot video stream dot read next okay, connect dot video stream read or get next frame was it? Yeah, get next frame. And <clears throat> it's asking for one parameter, which is uh, milliseconds wait. It, this basically uh, refers to the amount of time in milliseconds that you want the connect to wait if there is no data in the buffer. So when, when this call happens, connect will go to the, uh, this, my program will go to the buffer in the connect memory and see if there is a frame there. If, it, if there is a frame there, it will bring it back. If there is no frame there, if the buffer is empty, this wait time, uh, whatever you provide in milliseconds, is going to say block the program for, in this case, 1,000 milliseconds or one second, wait for a frame to get generated, and then bring it back, right? But what I'm going to do now is I, I'm just going to be like, I'm going to put a value of zero, saying I don't want you to block the program. If there's no data in the, in the frame buffer, just come back, it's fine. We'll go back and get the new data, right? So that's all I'm doing. It's just one line of code that, that basically tells my program to go to the connect memory, grab a video frame buffer and bring it back. And that's it. I'm gonna hit F5 now. So it really doesn't look like it's done anything, but if I click this button, um, I hope it doesn't throw an exception. Okay, actually, it's interesting. It's not doing anything. And I will tell you why. Okay, any guesses on why it's not doing anything? For those of you that have programmed the VPF for, it should be pretty obvious. I'll tell you why. Because it's going and getting the next frame, but what is it doing with it? Nothing, right? I saw a head, head not there. It's doing nothing with it, right? What we need to do is we need to take this and, and assign it to the image frames. Um, you see image has a property called source. We need to take that data and assign it to source only then will something happen on the screen. It's actually going and getting the data now, but it's just not doing anything with it. So what I need to do is basically do something like this. Uh, image one dot source equals whatever data. But here's the problem. Source only takes a well-formed image of type image source, right? It basically needs a proper bitmap or a proper JPEG or whatever. The problem is the data I get back from this call to get next frame returns something of type image frame. Let me show you. Image frame iframe equals. Okay, image frame iframe equals get this, right? But here's the problem. I cannot pass it straight image one dot source equals I cannot do this because the type that this returns is different from the type that this takes. In fact, if I run this now, you see I get a build error because it cannot convert it. Um, and so we'll talk about how to make it into a format that's acceptable, but let's actually look to see what is the data that's actually coming back. So I'm going to delete this line and I'm just going to say int i equals zero or something just to create some random line here so I can set a breakpoint on this so that we can go execute the previous line and see what happens. So I run my program, I click this button, and now you see my breakpoint got hit, which basically means that this line already is executed. So let's go in and see what iframe is. iframe we know is the image frame data type. So actually before we do that, let's go into reflector and see what image frame returns. Because remember, get next frame right here returns something of type image frame, so if I click that, it'll tell me what's inside image frame that I'm getting back, right? 
So what I'm saying is a few properties, I think the most important properties are these three properties. First one is a timestamp, right? It returns the timestamp at which that image was actually read by the camera, right? It also returns a frame number, which basically is just a sequential number uh, of the frame that was read by the camera. But the most important piece of data is in this property called image. We see it's actually of type planar image. So let's go in and see what it is. And you basically see planar image basically has these properties. It has a width and it has a height of the image. It has something called bytes per pixel, which basically denotes how many bytes does it take to denote one pixel in that image. But most importantly, it has this field called bits, which is of type byte array, right? It's just this really long number, actually this really long array of bytes that actually contains RGB values, right? So that's what uh, bits is. So the data for the image lives in this field right here. So what we're gonna do is, let's examine this in terms of what we actually got back. So you see, in my image frame, I get a frame number back of 58, right? Which means after I open, this is the 58th frame that's being uh, captured. My resolution is 640 by 480, timestamp is 1911. That uh, timestamp is basically a number in milliseconds, right? So it basically means this image was uh, captured 1.9 seconds after the camera was open and stuff like that. But the most important uh, piece of data we saw, it lives in something called image. So I expand this and I see that it has a height property of 480, width of 640, bytes per pixel of four, because it's encoding in RGB format. Uh, R, G, and B are the components for red, green, and blue colors. Each takes one byte to represent because the value can range between zero and 255. Uh, but it is inefficient to read three bytes of data from computer memory, right? You should read sort of in multiples of the um, register size of the CPU. So it's, it's sort of getting into computer architecture now. But basically, suffice it to say, it is efficient to read uh, memory in sort of multiples of two, right? So two bytes at a time, four bytes at a time, and so on. So reading three bytes at a time is not efficient. So what happens is, even though it only needs three bytes of data to store red, green, and blue, it'll assign four bytes of data, where the fourth byte will always be zero, just so it can read it, uh, read it really fast. Uh, so that's your bytes per pixel right there. But the actual data lives right here in bits. And as you can see, bits is just a byte array that is 122 no, it, it actually is 1,228,800 elements long. And I hope you understand where this number comes from, right? It basically, let's actually see where this number comes from. It's actually just your 640 times 480, which is your resolution of the image, right? These are that many pixels in the image, and each pixel needs four bytes. And that is this number, 1,228,800 is this number right here, right here. So literally, as you can see, it, it only contains data for each pixel uh, in the image. And if you open it, you can actually see what I'm talking about. Oops, sorry. If you open it, you can see what I'm talking about. The first. So the first four bytes are for the first pixel, top left, right? So you can see, actually, it's stored as BGR. So the value of B, blue is 61. The value of green is 69. R is 63. And then the fourth byte is unused, so it's going to be 0. Similarly, the next pixel is 58, 68, 57, 68, 63, 0. So you'll always find that the fourth element is always 0, right? It's just unused. But the rest are actually valid values from 0 through 255 indicating the intensity of that color channel and that pixel, right? So that is the format in which Connect returns data back. It's just raw RGB data. Now here's the fundamental problem. The, the format for my image control needs to be a well-formed image. It cannot be raw data. So what we need is some helper function that allows me to take this raw RGB data and convert it into a proper bitmap, right? 
And so WPF, and that's why I chose WPF to program this, on this demo at least, uh, is because WPF offers me this class called bitmap source that has a method called create, which does this uh, exact thing that we're looking for. It takes uh, raw RGB data, or raw any kind of data, we'll see in a second, and converts it into a proper well-formed bitmap that we can then pass on to the image source control, right? So, so let's go see what we need to supply here. Uh, the first thing it needs is something called pixel width, right? We know that the width <coughs> of the image is contained in iframe dot uh, image dot width. Right, similarly the height is contained in iframe dot image dot height. So all of this data we are getting from the image frame that we pulled back from the connect uh, buffer. Uh, the next property it needs is something called a DPI, dot square inch, which is basically the the display density of your uh, screen or display uh, unit. In all cases, except when you get a custom monitor, a high density custom monitor uh, for scientific applications or engineering applications or architectural applications, in all cases, the value for DPI X and DPI Y is 96. <clears throat> Ideally, you would get this through the environment variables in, in Windows, but for simplicity, I'm just going to hard code them at 96 because in about 99.9% .9 of the monitors in the world, this value is 96. Uh, the next property it needs is something called pixel formats. And you'll see basically pixel formats is an enumeration of all of the different ways uh, in which you can encode an image, right? So we're basically going to say that I want you to encode this new image that you're creating as a BGR32, right? A blue, green, red 32 format. But you can also encode it in any other different, you know, in, in sort of grays or um, the, the BGR with an alpha channel or whatever, right? So you can basically choose the kind of image that you want to output from bitmap source. But for now, I'm just going to say I want BGR32. And the fact that Connect returns it to us in the BG RGB format makes that means that this is the format that we need to choose. Uh, then it expects an option for something called a bitmap palette. A palette basically is a Windows, um, a Windows item which basically allows you to choose custom palettes. You know how in Windows, if I were to show you this. In Windows, if you go into, I believe it's personalized, and if you come in here and if you choose window color, no, not this. I forget where it is actually, maybe it's an advanced, oh, there it is. Um, there's, or maybe it's not here. But there's this place in Windows you can go to where you can choose to change the default Windows color uh, if you're uh, either color blind to a particular color or if you need like a high visibility format or monochrome format, you can make those changes, right? So those are the custom palettes. So what happens with a custom palette is, uh, if, if a window comes up and it's, it has a green color, what Windows will do is, if you set a custom palette that takes away the color green and displays it an orange or something instead of a color green, the custom palette will come in and everywhere the screen is painted green, it'll paint, paint over it with a color orange. But at this point, we don't really have any custom palettes, so I'm just gonna say no. Um, and then finally, it's asking me for the actual array of pixels, right, which is the actual data that needs to get rendered as a bitmap image. And so I know that that data lives in iframe.image.bits, right? Because bits is the big long array that needs to get converted into an image that can then get sent to an image control to get displayed on the screen. And the final property that my bitmap source control uh, needs is something called stride. And explain what stride is. Stride is basically the amount of bytes in one row of the image, right? So in terms of what it is, it's pretty easy to understand. So the, the amount of bytes in one row of the image can be denoted as uh, iframe.image.width, right? Because this is the number of pixels in one row. 
times iframe dot image dot bytes per pixel because this is the number of bytes per pixel. So multiplying these two gives me the amount of bytes in one row of the image. Now I'm going to take a second and help help us understand why stride is important. Now you saw that the data in bits, right, right here, is just this long one-dimensional array. It's just this, you know, series of numbers. Bitmap source or create needs to take this big series of numbers and convert it into a proper 2D image, right, two-dimensional image. So we need to tell this control or this uh, method how many pixels there are and how many bytes there are in each row so that after reading that many bytes, it can take all the data that comes after that and compose it as the next row of images, and then as the next row. Does that make sense? When you paint a 2D image, you need to have a stride, right? And that's it. So basically what has happened now is bitmap source of create has taken all of the data that got returned from the get next frame method and converted it into a proper bitmap source, into a proper bitmap. And the best part is it returns since I've done the bitmap, I can just feed it directly into my source property of my image. So does that make sense? What I'm going to do is just basically say image one dot source equals blah, right? And now if I run my application, it still shows the ball, but now when I click the button, it basically returns that frame and one frame from the RGB camera. Does that make sense? So let's do it again. Let's let's point. Let's actually point it at Heidi, and then oh, we can't see not enough lighting. Okay, let's point it at that area, which seems really well lit. There it is. You see, so every time I push this button, this call will actually go grab the the frame of memory or grab the frame, the image frame that's in the connect memory, pull it, convert it into a bitmap source, and send it to this image once source method. <coughs> Sorry? It became a camera. It became a simple digital camera. There you go. Ta -da, ta -da. All that needs is like a little flash sticking up here. And you have a full-fledged digital camera. It's a little too big to put in your pocket along with the laptop, but still, it's a, it's a camera. So the, the key point is, I, I hope you understand the key point I'm trying to make here is it, it actually took us how much? Let me let me rearrange my code a little bit so I can uh, my all my uninitialized logic. Let me move it towards the very end. And so the one thing I'm hoping you get to see is all of the code that we wrote is right here, which literally is five lines of code. I mean, it seems more because I've broken it into multiple lines. But in five lines of code, I was able to initialize my, or actually create an instance to my connect, create a reference to my connect, initialize it with the option saying, I want to use the data from my color camera. And then uh, I basically open the stream to my color camera. By saying video stream, I'm referring to the, the RGB or the color camera. And then I open the stream. At this point, at the end of this call, the connect is, the camera is open, it's continuously reading data. Now whether or not we use the data is pointless. It's actually continuously reading data, and all the data that it's reading, it's storing it in the buffer, in the frame buffer, right? Uh, in, you know the number that we set here, two? It basically allocates two frames in this memory, and alternatively, it'll keep filling those two frames. If you haven't pulled the data, it doesn't matter. It'll just get overridden with the new frame that comes in. It'll just keep writing data in these two frames. What we are doing as a response to button one to click is now we're finally going and reading the data that's stored in the frame. And uh, since we cannot directly display the data that comes back from the get next frame uh, call, we are basically passing it to this uh, method called the bitmap source or create to create a proper well-formed bitmap that we then pass into image one's source property. That's, that's all we're doing. That's basically it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. 
Now, this is slightly, if you think about it, it's slightly inconvenient because, I mean, it's reading data and all, but I have to keep pushing this button, you know. I, every time I want a new frame, I have to keep pushing this button. I think what this allows me to do now is show off the next major thing I wanted to show you, which is basically the event that the runtime class exposes, right? So over here, I basically have these three events. Video frame ready, which is right here, depth frame ready, and skeleton frame ready, right? So connect basically what it does is after you open the um, video stream or the depth stream, it will start reading data. And it'll after it reads the data, like we said, it will store it into the buffer, into the memory, right? Immediately after that, what it will do is it will signal to our program that a frame is ready to be read in the buffer. And so at that point, we can go in and read the frame instead of manually pushing the button over and over. And the event that it fires is this right here, video frame ready. So what I can do is right after this call to video stream got open, I can come in and say, I am interested in uh, this event called video frame ready and I want to subscribe to that event. And the way you subscribe to an event in, in C-sharp and .NET is by saying plus equals. Right? When you do plus equals, what happens is uh, any method name that follows will automatically get called when this event fires. And Visual Studio is smart enough to realize that I need a new event handler and it's automatically typed this stuff in. So all I have to do is hit tab is I have to hit tab and Visual Studio will automatically generate that event handler for me. I mean, it's an empty event handler, right? It basically at this point just says throw not implemented exception. So it's empty, it's, it's really useless. Uh, but the structure <coughs> excuse me, is already in place. So which means when this event fires, this method is gonna get called. Which means what I can do now is this bit of code that I have right here, I can just move it here. Right, so image one dot source equals bitmap source up here, iframe dot image dot width. But here's the problem. iframe is is obtained here by calling get next frame. But in the event, what happens is the event is smart enough to realize that when the event fires, what we'll be interested in is the actual image frame. And so what it does is it passes the image frame to us as an argument in this named parameter E, in this, in this parameter called E. So let me write the code and we'll look at it in a second. So I'm gonna say the same thing. Actually, you know what, let me do this. Let me just copy this line of code, paste it here. But instead of saying connect.videostream.getNextFrame, I'm just gonna say E dot, and an image frame is already sent for me. So does this make sense? When connect reads an image frame, it stores it to its memory, fires an event, and sends me a copy of this image frame. Which means my program doesn't even have to go to the connect and pull it manually from memory. Connect is automatically sending me that copy of data, right, so that image frame, that one frame of that image is automatically being sent. And then right after that, all I have to do is, is the code for doing the next thing is exactly the same. I just take the image frame, process that into a bitmap source, and display it in my image one of source, right? Now if I hit F5, uh, let, me ask you, let me say one more thing. Now this is going to keep running continuously, right? As soon as I open, can I continuously reading, continuously firing my event, continuously the stuff is, uh, getting executed. So now if I run the uh, code, what do I expect to see? So almost like video, right? Continuously updating video. There it is. Right, so, so literally, let's say here is a very brief video camera demonstration. So it's just basically a sequence of uh, individual frames that just keeps getting updated uh, 30 times per second. So, so what do you guys think? Any questions so far? 
All right. So before we move on to the next thing, I also want to, I had a couple of questions before the break about a couple of things that come back along with the video stream, which is, you know, things like, in the image frame, things like the timestamp and the frame number, you know, useful for synchronizing and uh, stuff like that. So let me show you what actually gets to time, right? So in my main window, let me go in, and let me go into my toolbox, <coughs> and let me add a label, right? a small, simple label. Let me move this label here. Let me get rid of my button, because I don't need the button anymore. So I have a label here, and I'm just gonna copy paste the label again, and I have a label next to it. So this first label, I think it's called label one, yeah, and the next label is label two. So here's label, just I think it's label one. <coughs> yep, and the next label is called label two. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just uh, print out the information that I get uh, in terms of the frame number and the timestamp in label one and label two, right? So every as, e as we get each and every frame, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say label one dot, um, Content, I believe. Yes. Label one dot content equals high frame dot frame number. So the first label is going to contain the frame number. The next label is going to contain <coughs> the timestamp. Right? So, which means every frame it will keep getting updated. So let's run this now and see what happens. So, you actually see that these values keep getting updated. Uh, so this, uh, let me, uh, the point I wanted to make was the frame number you will see gets updated sequentially, right? One after the other, it's kind of hard to read now. But I'll, I'll run a smaller demo and show you. It actually updates sequentially, whereas the next number, which is a timestamp, is actually a raw measure of how much time has elapsed between the time <coughs> between one frame and the next frame, starting with zero. So, where this will become really useful is if you're synchronizing multiple connects or if you're synchronizing the feed from the video camera and the feed from the camera, it's, it's always helpful to synchronize between frame numbers and timestamps, right? And, and that way you can be sure that the data that's coming from one camera subsystem is uh, correlated with the data that came from the other camera subsystem. And this is especially crucial if you're doing a cross multiple connects uh, to make sure that the data stays in sync. Because as you can imagine, with varying loads on the PC, you can you can imagine the data will actually get slowly out of sync, depending on, uh, because Windows and, and pretty much any OS today is sort of the whole uh, multi-program, you know, um, multi-thread architecture. So based on thread priority, based on process priority, so many things can happen. And, and the other thing also is, the data that actually gets pulled from the Kinect, the raw cameras in the Kinect, is actually done by kernel mode drivers, whereas the data that gets sent into the program from the buffer is actually done using user mode drivers, right? So basically both are running as different threads in different priorities. So, so many things can get out of sync. So, if you're doing anything even remotely complex across coordinating between images and depth and all of that, use frame numbers and timestamps, and it's literally as easy as this. Just call frame number and timestamp. The one other question that I got was about um, the tilt sensor, and the question was, can we control it manually? And the answer is yes, and let me show you how to do that. Let me bring in a text box. So a text box allows me to type some value, and I'm going to bring in a button right next door. There's a button. Here's a button. I grab this button, place it next to the text box. So I'm just going to run it, but I, I'm going to tell you what I think I want to do. I want to enter a number between minus 27 and plus 27, so something like I don't know, 15 or something, and I want to hit the button, and I want the connect to uh, go to that angle of view, right? So that's what we want to do. So the way to code that is super straightforward. It's just double click button to get into the button event handler. And I'm going to say something like connect dot newy camera 
And Dewey camera basically is a class that denotes the physical connect device, right? So if you look at what's inside Dewey camera, you'll actually see three or four very important properties. Uh, one is elevation angle, which is basically the angle at which connect is looking. And this is what gets controlled. This is what actually controls the motor, uh, the tilt motor inside the uh, connect. So for what I want to do right now, I'm just going to say, Movie camera dot elevation angle equals Xbox Xbox one dot text. I think elevation angle is an integer. What I'm going to get out of text is a string, so I might have to do something like parse or what is that? Um, um, how do you parse um, dot? Something about parts. Integer about parts. Oh, sorry. Integer about parts. Thank you very much. Int32 uh, int dot parts. Parts. There it is. Thanks. Uh, and take this and make it to an int. And boom, that's it. So now it's going to return. Let's see. This returns an int. This takes an int. I think it should be okay. So let me run this. And it's now running. So say I want to look down a little bit, right? So I'm going to say, give me an angle of minus 10 push this button, and you see how the connect moves a little down. And now I can basically say, look at the lights up there. So I can basically say 27, and say push this button, and now it's going to look up and show me lights up there, right? Uh, here's the thing, though. The connect motor is um, uh, really, really small, and so if you do this a lot, it'll get overheated and actually literally break, right? So what they, uh, the way they've sort of made, it, made a safety mechanism is if you do this more than five times in a minute period or something, it'll throw an exception. So at the risk of breaking my connect, let me do this and show you. So we did that, right? And now we push it up to 27 again. And see, the whole time that's happening, everything else freezes because um, At some point, it should throw me an exception, but uh, anyway, I don't want to push it too much. But but if you see a random exception come out while something like this is happening, the problem is not with your code. The problem is Connect trying to protect itself uh, by uh, preventing too many motor operations at the same time. But, but basically, yeah. But that's how you set the elevation angle. Uh, the one last thing I wanted to mention as we're talking about but the movie camera is actually let me go back in here. And sort of in, in, you know what instead of showing the um, the frame numbers and timestamps, let me delete this and let me use that to show you something else. Because we looked at the fact that connect dot camera has a couple other interesting properties. One is elevation angle obviously which we used to set uh, the angle, it also has something called unique device name, right? And this basically is the the full USB name that Windows gives to connect. And this is guaranteed to be unique across multiple uh, devices. So let's do this. If I look at what it is, it's a string. So I can basically take it and send it to mango1.com. And now if I run this, you'll actually see You'll actually see that this, and it's actually truncating it a little bit. Uh, let me do this. Let me grab the little two, take a look at it, make this really long. Let's run this again. Let's set the angle to be zero so it doesn't have to move. And, and even now it's truncating, but literally this this uh, number right here can be used to identify your connect. So again, in a, in a case where you're chaining your connect, sometimes the chain order, if you change, what will happen is the connect uh, number system inside the connect's connection will change. So to keep track of which connect is looking where and coordinating between multiple connects, we 
we always recommend that you use <coughs> this frame which is guaranteed to be unique across each connect in the known universe, right? So each connect will have a separate USB string uh, and then like a device name that we encourage you to use if you're trying to track multiple connects at the same time. So that's that's your new camera. And obviously you can go explore Nui camera here as well. If you come into runtime, you see one of the properties exposed is Nui camera, which is of type camera. So if you click on camera, it tells you uh, there's a few properties, elevation angle and unique device name, which is what we explored. Uh, there's this method, which we'll look at uh, in a second, right after we talk about depth cameras. And then it tells basically what is called the elevation maximum and the elevation minimum. You know how I said the limit between up and down is uh, plus 27 degrees to minus 27 degrees? That's basically this right here. Uh, if I if I show what this is, it's actually not showing it now, but it's actually set in the source code right here. So you'll actually see elevation minimum is minus 27. Elevation maximum is actually, weirdly enough, it's set in hex. But if you look at what 1B is in hex, we will give me the programmer and give me hex. And now if I say 1B and convert it into decimal, actually plus 27, right? So this is how uh, we say plus 27, minus 27. All right, so that was uh, all of the types in the Nui camera. So so just let's take one minute to really quickly recap everything we've looked at so far. We looked at the way to program your Connect is to use the runtime class. You create a new instance of runtime uh, by choosing one device from your Connect collection we saw that the Connects collection obviously exposes something called, uh, exposes, it's a collection, so it exposes a count property that tells you how many Connects you have. And the way you initialize is by choosing one index. In this case, I chose index zero because I only have one Connect. And once you do that, you basically call the initialize method. And once you create the initialize method, the drivers are set up, everything is set up, so you can actually start using the subsystems inside the Connect. What we did was we started using the video stream, uh, which is uh, the video subsystem. And video stream of, is of type image stream, so we, let's go into image stream. In image stream, you see that there's three methods. What we did was we basically <coughs> explored the use of using open, right? Which opens up the video subsystem that starts getting the data inside, stores it into the buffer, which is what the pool size here is. And then we talked about accessing the data using the get next frame method call. This is a manual polling way of accessing data from the raw stream. So when the, regardless of how you get the data, once the data comes in, it has these properties, right? It basically has a height, it has a width, it has a resolution and all of that. And um, uh, it basically sends the raw data uh, in whatever format you request. Now you can take the data and do whatever you want to do with it. You can basically, uh, like we did, you can you can do something like uh, make it into a, a bitmap source and show it on the screen. But you could imagine from doing something else. You could imagine just taking the raw data and storing it to disk, and instead of making it into a bitmap source, you probably perhaps can make it into a MPG format or WMV format and make a movie of it. Or you can take the data and instead of showing it on the screen, put it on a network socket, and you've just created yourself a video chat application, right? Uh, what the data will do is traverse across the network stream and show up on the other end. So literally, it's, it's limitless what you can do at this point. Literally, you, you have the data from the video stream, is what I'm talking about. We also looked at um, the option of, uh, instead of using the polling method with get next frame, we looked at the option of hooking onto one of these methods, in, in our case, the video frame ready uh, event, which basically allows you to uh, automatically get called every time a frame is ready in the buffer to be read. And the best part is when you do this, you don't even have to call the get next frame manually. The data, the image frame data from the buffer is automatically copied and sent to your event handler where you can just basically take it and consume it any way you want. So which is the current approach that we're using right now. When the video frame ready gets called, this uh, event argument E has this property called image frame that has the relevant data already retrieved from the buffer. We also looked at a couple of properties in uh, image stream, like, 
on the investment properties. But we look at uh, a couple of properties in, um, uh, where was that? Yeah, we looked at, uh, exactly, we looked at frame number and the timestamp properties, and we looked at a couple of properties in the uh, Nui camera class, which basically represents the hardware connect device. We looked at the elevation angle, how you can set that, make the camera move, and we looked at how you can um, retrieve the, the unique device that you come to connect. So, I know we've only looked at video camera yet, we haven't looked at depth, we haven't looked at skeleton, but the point I'm trying to make is if you, if you understand where we are so far, you basically get Connect program because I'm going to show you how to do depth and how to do skeleton right after this. But you you're going to see that the process is exactly the same. The code we're going to write is going to be exactly the same, right? So this is sort of the fundamental building block of um, sort of the, the sort of the way to think about accessing data from the internet. Any questions so far? Okay, cool. How are we doing on time? One hour, perfect. Okay, so why don't we do this? The next thing let's do is let's start working with uh, depth data. So instead of having just one image, <coughs> let me, actually no, forget about images for a second. Let me come back into our source code. Let me show you how to start using depth data because again, that's one of the coolest aspects of the, of the connect. But before I do that, let me show you a couple of slides because I think that's gonna help us. Okay, so we left off here. We looked at the different namespaces and reflector. We saw that runtime is the most important class. Okay, this is important. Uh, we saw the different streams that are possible from the connect. We looked at the color stream. Uh, the default resolution is 640, 480, but it can also be 1280 by 1024 if you want. Now, I just got a quick comment to make here. If you do 640 by 480, your um, your um, frame rate is going to be 30 hertz, right? 30 frames per second. If you do 1020, if you do 1280 by 1024, your frame rate will drop to anywhere from 10 to 12 frames per second, right? So that's something you have to keep in mind. You're gonna you're gonna be paying a price for getting a higher quality frame rate. Uh, if you're if all you're doing is something like a chat application, it really doesn't matter. You know, 10 to 12 frames is still pretty good. But if you're doing something with near real-time video, then you probably need 30 frames a second and so 40, 40, 40, 40. Similarly, depth screen is a 320 by 240 resolution. Uh, I also said that you can actually pull an 80 by 60 uh, frame. It's a much lower resolution, but if you're tracking, say, only one human or something like that, um, that could be sufficient. To uh, the reason you would probably do 80 by 60 and not 320 by 240 is if you feel that you're running an application and it's on a really slow PC and your bandwidth is really constrained and all of that and your application is not working at all properly, then try 80 by 60, right? I mean, it might, it might uh, make things a little faster uh, and see if it works for you. But basically, the default resolution of a depth stream is 320 by 240. And the key thing I want to point is even though it seems like it is returning an image, it's actually not returning an image. The depth camera does take what it sees in front of it, and it breaks it into a 320 by 240 image, but the data that's coming in at each pixel is not RGB values, it is not grayscale values. It is the distance between the camera and the device it sees. And um, I think I called it out in the next slide, but there is a very specific range that the connect can see. For instance, the connect cannot see through the end of the, through the back of this room, right? The connect cannot see something that's too close to it either. The connect can only see distances between 850 millimeters, which is almost like uh, one one meter away, to about four meters, right? To about 4,000 millimeters. So we'll look at that in the next couple of seconds, uh, slides. We saw how uh, the connect can actually that are down frame numbers, timestamps, and the tilt sensor data, uh, and we'll look at the audio stuff in the next few slides. So we looked at RGB, again, we, and this is important, we looked at how you can access data from the camera using the eventing model. When you call the, uh, when the event fires, it'll pass you an image frame, and inside the image frame, you basically get all of these different components, right, the frame number, the timestamp, and all of that. But the most important property there is obviously this field called image. 
and inside the image field, you get the actual raw data in this field called bits. And we saw all of this. Uh, so this is just more detail. It's just 32 by bits per pixel stored in the BGR32 format, you know, blue channel, green channel, red channel, MP channel, all taking up 32 bits per pixel. And um, the, the way the array is set up is it starts at 0, 0, top left, moves left to right, left to right, left to right, and so on and so forth. That is why you need the stride to indicate how many bytes are in one row. So right after that row, you start reading the data and you start reading the next row and so on. We talked about stride just now. So we saw the demo of the RGB camera as well. Now let's actually talk about the depth camera. The uh, depth camera does, there, there's, um, Two, there's two ways that Connect allows you to use the depth camera. One, it gives you the raw data from the depth camera. Or the second way is it can give you slightly processed data from the depth camera. And by slightly processed, what I'm talking is it will do something called player segmentation. So <clears throat> on the left, you basically see, or actually let's look at this, um, let's look at a scene where you know it's, it's seen a 3D scene, and there's a person standing in front of it. By just getting the raw data back, it'll send you the, the raw distances across each pixel in the 320 by 240 image that it's created. Uh, but when you turn on player segmentation, what it also does is it applies the object recognition algorithm and figures out if in the frame that it is seeing, it can identify a human character. And the way it identifies a human character is to be able to see in fact, this is a good estimation. It should be able to see the head all the way to at least the beginning of the knees. <coughs> if it can see uh, the head to knee, it can uh, identify a person as a player and not just return the raw distance, it will also return if on that pixel it thinks that there is a player present or not. So at this point, it is still not doing skeletal tracking. It's still not giving you the head position, the shoulder joint position, the hand position, and all that. It just tells you, at this location, I think there's a human being, or at this location, I don't think there's a human being, right? What is a fantastic application of this? Green screen uh, is a great application of this. Uh, green screen is obviously a setup where you set up a player uh, in front of originally a green screen, and then you record somebody doing something, and then later in post-production, instead of the green screen, you actually put the scenery behind, right? In, in the movies where you see somebody driving a car really fast and all that, they maybe are not. They're just sitting around in, in front of a green screen, and then you substitute the background much later. This is a very low-cost way to simulate a green screen because of player segmentation, which we'll look at in the demo in a second. So um, the way to access depth data is exactly the same as the way to access video data, right? You hook into the event, it'll return an image frame, and all of the data is going to be in, in, inside the image field of the image frame, and all of the depth data is still going to be inside bits, right? So it's exactly the same as before, which we'll see in a second. But the important distinction here is that instead of 640-480, the default is 320 and uh, depending on if you use just the raw depth data, if you ask back for just the raw depth data, or if you ask for depth data and player index, which is you know player segmentation, if you turn it on, uh, you will get the data in slightly different formats. If you ask for just the raw depth data, your depth is going to be represented in 12 bits, right? It's going to take 12 bits to represent your depth, and in the 16-bit structure that gets sent back. The lowermost 12 bits are uh, <coughs> going to be the, encoded with the depth data. The uppermost four bits are going to be blank, are going to be zero, right? So, which is what I call that right here. Uppermost four bits are unused. The lower four bits <coughs> are, or the lower 12 bits are the depth data. And like we said, the the visible range or the depth range for a Kinect is between 800 millimeters, which is almost one meter, to about 4 meters, 4,000. So that is the range, and that's what gets encoded in um, the byte. Quick question. Does anybody know why uh, depth is represented in 12 bits? Anybody? Now, if, if, um, if, 
if the range of the connect were different, if instead of it being between 800 to 4,000, say, had it been between 800 to 8,000, would we have needed more than 12 bits? Yes, right, because 12, and this is a fantastic trivia question, uh, in 12 bits, you can represent a number up to 2 power 12, which is 4K, right, which is 4,096. And as it so happens, since Connect can only look up to 4 meters, up to 4,000, 12 bits is exactly enough to represent uh, this range. In fact, even 11 bits would not have been enough, even if you consider the fact that it can only go from 800 to 4,000. So effectively, it can encode 3,200 millimeters. You still need 12 bits to encode 3,200, because 11 bits were only encoded. So, so that's that's the reason for 12 bits, and it's uh, it's always a fun question. But but literally, that's what happens. You get a raw 12 bit image instead of getting RGB image like before, red, green, and blue channels. You get a 12 bit um, depth information. It's just going to return a number which is going to be between 800 and 4,000 across 12 bits. Now here's a really interesting part. If you turn on player segmentation, which basically means if you say, connect, I want you to uh, identify a, uh, you know, human characters in the depth frame, then it will use 12 bits as before for the depth data, right? It will return the exact same depth data as before, but it will also return player mask in three bits. So a connect can uh, recognize up to six people standing in front of you, right? So if, if six people line up, so if 10 people line up before a connect, it can identify up to six human characters in a frame, right? So um, the values for the segmentation mask will be between zero and six. If it's zero, it means that it doesn't see any humans in the frame. One means one human, two means two humans, and so on, up to a maximum of six. So from zero through six, that's like seven numbers right there. So we use three bits, because <coughs> three bits can encode up to eight, right? Two plus three is eight. So we use three bits to uh, denote how many characters that are uh, on the scene, and that now becomes the lower three bits, and then the next 12 bits uh, are your depth, and then the uppermost last bit, the 16th bit from the right, is unused. Does that make sense? So when you use depth data, you have to be careful if you're using use the use depth option or if you're using the use depth and player index option because accordingly, uh, the, the content encoding system will change. Um, and here's another interesting thing. All of the, these values are stored in little endian format. Everybody understands little endian, right? Little endian being if a number is broken across multiple bytes, then let me let me tell you with an example. Say I want to represent, for those of you that don't know Little Endian, uh, say I want to represent the number 12, right? <clears throat> the way I would write it is I would write the one first, and then I would write the two first, uh, because as humans, we intuitively follow the big Endian format, right? Whatever is the bigger number, we end up writing it first, right? So when I say 12,